Welcome to the End of Slavery Summit. This is Corey Angelotti, and I'm here with a very special interview with somebody who's a great inspiration of mine, Mark Passio. In this interview, we're going to go and dive deep into what it means to say that government is slavery. Now, this is a very powerful term that Mark Passio and myself use as a means to show that slavery still exists in through political slavery, as many abolitionists of the past were also warning us. Uh, but we're going to dive deep into breaking this down and finding out what it really means, because this is crucial. A lot of people are participating in governments or in creating governments and don't realize that when they want to limit government, they don't even know how how to do that in the first place or what it even means to try to limit government. So this interview is going to be world breaking, very important. I recommend staying tuned to watch this whole thing. I'm joined by my co-host Aaron Butler for this. This is great. I hope you can stay tuned and watch the whole thing. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, for, it shows a lot of initiative for putting together an event of this scope, uh, this scale. Uh, and uh, that's what doing the great work is all about as far as I'm concerned. So uh, thank you guys for doing something like this. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Of course. Glad to be here. Yeah, so let's let's kind of dive deep if you don't mind. Um, can you define for us what is slavery? At the very core essence, uh, slavery is the claim of ownership over another being in any form or fashion. If you are making a claim that another being must or must not do things based upon your own will and your own commands toward them and uh, you are doing things like confiscating their labor in whole or in part controlling and restricting their movement in any way controlling or restricting their speech etc now this is barring that they are actively and actually per initiating harm to you or another being then you always retain and maintain the natural right to stop them from performing those actions that is not what we're talking about that's self-defense that is not what we're talking about when it comes to the claim of ownership on another being so uh it's very easy to see overt slavery overt slavery comes in the form of uh Things like chattel slavery, which, uh, you know, we saw in this country back, you know, a couple hundred years ago uh, in the colonial days and uh, all the way up through the Civil War era period. That is very easy to recognize as slavery because the beings who are being held in captivity are held there by direct, active, visible violence. They're being held in that position by weaponry, by people with weaponry, uh, those who are actively claiming openly to be their owners. And uh, they and the other people who are witnessing the situation overtly can see that this is a scenario where certain beings are claiming to own other beings. And those beings who are being claimed to be property are not free to do as they please, even if they are not harming someone else if they're not uh, initiating aggression or harm against another being so it's very easy to see for human beings to see and recognize overt forms of slavery when you know we're talking about the form of slavery that is the largest form of slavery that is active today we're not talking about overt slavery does overt slavery continue to exist in our world absolutely yes it does unfortunately in in certain places in many places and that's uh you know horrifically deplorable and that practice should not be allowed to continue it should be stopped by any amount of force necessary to stop it wherever it's taking place but what we're largely talking about in a you know uh, an event such as this and in the freedom movement in general for those who do deeply understand slavery there is a form of slavery that is a little bit or in for many people much harder to see much more difficult to perceive and that is covert slavery covert slavery works through mental forms of manipulation to get the people who are uh, having a claim of ownership made upon their person or their property, their body or their property, um, to influence them to believe that that situation is acceptable, justifiable, 
or even moral or even necessary that it must be that way and it must continue. And this is the most dangerous form of slavery. Covert slavery is even a more devastatingly dangerous form of slavery because in in overt slavery, no one with a sensible moral compass actually believes that the situation is justifiable. I would certainly hope that today in our in today's world with the information that is available, no one believes that genuinely one being has the right to go and capture and enslave and put to work as they see fit another human being. And uh, if they did, they're pretty psychopathic. They're, they're psychopaths out in the open. Uh, most people don't believe that overt slavery is moral or justifiable. They know that it is violence. They know that it is a wrong behavior that should not be conducted against anyone. The problem lies in covert slavery. Covert slavery convinces people that the situation that is actually a violent scenario where people are being held under the threat, the continued threat of violence, which is called duress, if they do not obey the commands of the master class, the, uh, you know, those who are making the claims of ownership, um, that physical violence will be done to the people who do not obey those dictates, those commands that they call laws. And the, the form of covert slavery that is active in our world today called government convinces people that the situation that they are unjustly being held under, which is duress, is not only okay, is not only justifiable, that it is actually moral and necessary to prevent some form of chaos or uh, destruction or implosion uh, you know, or collapse of society from happening. When in fact, that is all brainwashing, that is all propaganda, that is all uh, social engineering that is, has been done to people since birth to get them to believe that that violent and immoral scenario is actually a moral one that is actually necessary to continue. And that's the most dangerous form of slavery there is as far as I am concerned. And that is because in an overt form of slavery, you could ask people, do, do those people have the right to do that type of violence to other people and hold them in that condition and hold them under that form of continued threat of violence? And again, the, the vast overwhelming majority of human beings are going to say, absolutely not. They don't have such a right. That is thuggery. That is absolute violence. But then if pe you ask people, well, does government have a right to exist and do they have the rights that they claim that they have over other people as authorities, you know, people will go, oh, absolutely they do. So you've can, the, the social engineer class of, of beings that runs this whole structure of our world has convinced the vast majority of human beings that covert slavery is perfectly acceptable, that all the forms of violence conducted in that system of covert slavery is just justifiable and even moral and even necessary. And it's because people don't go down to fundamental first principles and apply the action, the behavior to themselves. This is what people have a problem, an issue, a block of some kind. You could call it a mental virus of some sort that has been installed in their psyche. They have some block about applying a behavior that other people are doing, often even to them, to, the, to their own selves to apply that behavior to themselves and ask themselves the question, if you performed this behavior, would you consider that you were doing a moral action? And would it be okay? And would it be justifiable if you performed that behavior? This is the missing link that most people in the world do not do. They do not envision uh, the scenario 
they no, they don't visualize the scenario reversed. If you were doing this to another human being, what behavior would you expect back from that individual upon yourself? Would you expect them to defend themselves? Would you expect, you know, uh, possibly deadly force used against you or you to take this kind of violent behavior? And that's the reason they don't really see the behavior for what it is. They, in, they've, had installed into their psyche and into their their mental processes um malware it's like computer malware it's a virus and that virus is the basis of all forms of modern covert slavery and that virus is called authority the belief in authority is what prevents most people in the modern day from perceiving covert slavery as slavery they believe that these people have a right that does not exist they believe that people have the right to do these behaviors which in nature in point of fact reality in the natural realm those beings do not have the right to perform they have simply claimed the right to perform those behaviors but the the right does not exist in nature and that is why people are confused about the legitimacy the moral legitimacy of authority when in fact they shouldn't be confused about it because if they understood natural law if they understood what all of our equal natural rights are Notice I did not say we don't have equal natural abilities, but we all have equal natural rights. That means equality under our rights under natural law, not equality in the characteristics of our, our beings and our personalities. Of course, everyone is different in that regard, but we are all the same in the rights that we have that we are can perform without initiating violence to other. All human beings have the same rights. And what authority teaches you through the social engineering that installs that malware, that virus into the human psyche is that some people have rights that other people do not possess. And that is a lie. That is an untruth. That is falsity. OK, um, and this is what people have to work to do. They have to work to be able to see the covert form of slavery government through authority, through the belief in authority, by learning objective morality and learning what rights actually are. What rights does an individual human being possess to perform? They have the right to perform actions that do not initiate harm or violence to other sentient beings. And that is the same for all beings on this planet, all human beings on this planet. OK, again, natural law doesn't really, uh, um, you know, operate the way that it does in the human kingdom, in the animal kingdom. Animals don't have the types of brains and minds and psyches that we have. And it, that type of mind imparts the capabilities of understanding the difference between right behavior and wrong behavior, which is why natural law applies to human beings and not the animal kingdom. Uh, that is at a, a, a different and what many would just say a less complexified level of consciousness than human beings possess at this time in our evolutionary development. So the, the goal is to get this mental virus purged from the psyche of human beings that there is such a thing as authority over other beings. Authority is a claim and specifically, it is a claim of one being or one group of being are saying they have the right to issue commands to other beings. Now, what if we fundamentally break that down? The right to issue commands of compliance to other beings that you must do this behavior. Well, what are you going to do the behavior with? You're not going to do the behavior with a magic wand. You know, you're going to do the behavior with your body, right? So if I claim that your actions must comply to my demands, then I am indirectly making a second claim. I am making the, the covert indirect claim that what you perform with your body is not up to you. 
it is up to me to decide that behavior and then I command it upon you and then I do violence to you or I send people to do violence to you if you don't comply with that command. Okay, so what am I indirectly claiming ownership of? I'm not just claiming ownership of your actions because indirectly by proxy, if I claim ownership of your actions, I must claim ownership of your body because that is what you perform your actions with. So that is why all forms of authority, all forms of issuance of commands to other people is a claim of ownership upon the body and it is therefore slavery. If you simply look at what government is, government is not suggestions to other people. Government is commands of compliance through laws created by lawmaking bodies of people claiming to be authorities who can create law and bind that law upon other people, therefore making the claim of ownership over their behavior and thus their bodies. By definition, logically, we just followed the, the logical sequence of philosophical progression of what the actual behaviors are, what the actual definitions of the words are, and therefore by definition, definitively, factually, and objectively, government not only is slavery, by definition of authority, which is what government claims, it must be slavery. And therefore, it is an immoral situation. It is a situation by which people are held under the threat of violence and duress. And therefore, that immoral situation should not be allowed to continue and stand. It must be ended by human beings who claim to be moral beings and who claim to have a moral compass. So that is what you know. my whole mission is in this life has become is explaining that to other people from a philosophical perspective and hopefully getting them to understand that and then teach that to other people so we can spread that philosophical truth and uh end this immoral situation that we're all unfortunately currently living under a lot of stuff there um if, if i may i wanted to read one of your uh slides from sure. your fake ass christians presentation sure. and uh it says god's plan for everyone the great work to end slavery it is our shared responsibility at this time to help awaken others by continuously speaking the truth unapologetically even if we feel burdened by this task and even if it makes all of those involved feel uncomfortable courage and persistence are required to perform this task the true great work is the arduous task of influencing others to awaken to the truth it is to help them to realize that in supporting and condoning the legitimacy of authority and government man's law that they have actually been supporting and condoning, condoning the legitimacy of slavery and that they were immoral for having done so. In short, what the great work comes down to is to help people abandon their false religions, the erroneous, erroneous and dogmatic beliefs which hold back the progress of consciousness by impeding the reception of truth and natural law. And I want to follow that with a question. Sure. Uh, in your streetwise spirituality presentation, uh, you you said the first step or the first um, you know the first um, note that you you took when in people actually being awake was knowing about the occult and understanding that there are both light and dark aspects to it. Uh, how does knowledge of the occult help others awaken to covert slavery? So, in the world of occultism. Uh, first, we should simply define occult and occultism. Uh, the word occult from, comes from the Latin language, from the verb occultare, which means to hide, to conceal, or to keep secret. The verb itself, occultare, comes from the Latin noun oculus, which means eye. It means the ability to see, specifically the ability to see that which is difficult to see with the five senses. It has to be perceived with the mind. The, the sixth sense is truly the ability to think, comprehend, and understand what reality is and how it works. And that is what occultism attempts to convey to people. The laws of nature, those which are difficult to see with the eye and with traditional scientific measuring instrumentation, they are not physical quantities in the same sense that we measure 
uh, you know, forces like uh, uh, electromagnetism or gravity or uh, dynamic forces, uh, you know, uh, through motion at work in the world. Uh, those are quantifiable, measurable, very visible. When it comes to moral truths about what actions are right and which actions are wrong, that doesn't have a measuring stick applied to it. That has to be philosophized and thought through logically and thought out to its logical conclusion. And a lot of people don't have the tool sets to do that. Occultism, uh, meaning the, the psychological and mental tool sets of, of literally being able to logically think out a progression and apply it to morality and a moral situation. Uh, occultism attempts to convey those tools to people. And unfortunately, that is one of the reasons that it has been kept hidden. Uh, it is a grand leveler of sorts. You know, uh, in the tr occult tradition, Freemasonry, they call death the grand leveler, right? But the grand leveler of the chessboard of life is the ability to really learn how to think logically and to see things for what they really are, not to react emotionally, not to simply accept the mental malware that has been given to us by the social engineer class who are occultists. They are dark occultists who are trying to keep human consciousness uh, at a low level so that it doesn't wake up and it doesn't perceive the slavery that we are all embedded in. Uh, so uh, the, the, my general definition uh, that I use for occultism is one that has been accepted in the uh, occult circles and in the occult realm for quite some time. Occultism simply is the study of the hidden laws of nature, those which uh, cannot readily be seen with the eyes or with scientific instrumentation alone. It has to be fleshed out philosophically and morally, these truths. Uh, about behavior is what largely occultism is all about. The very deepest embedded uh, nugget of gold in the whole realm of occult thought and occult philosophy is natural law. It is the understanding of what human rights are, what human rights are not. It is the understanding of what our property actually is, what we may claim ownership of and what we may not claim ownership of because it is not our property. It is the understanding of all of the moral laws of the universe that actually govern the consequences of what happens to us individually and societally. Uh, and it largely operates over the aggregate of a body of people. People think that karmic law, which is another name for natural law, works in the second, like instant karma. You do something bad, something immediately bad happens to you. Unfortunately, that's an oversimplified and childish view of consciousness, uh, of, of, I'm sorry, um, uh, con uh, not conscious of um, karma, um, and it is a little bit more complexified than that. It actually truly works over a whole body of a population, the aggregate of society, and then it works over large periods of time, not very short orders of time. It takes a while for the consequential buildup and development that is then going to be given back to the body of the people, and that is going to be the situation, the environment that we then must live in. So we don't immediately make our bed and lie down in it. Collectively, in the aggregate, we all make our aggregate collective bed called the earth, called all of human global society, and then we all have to lay down in it eventually over time. That's how natural law and karma really works to bring us the consequences of all of our aggregate collective behavior. And I summarize it simply that the aggregate morality of a population is going to be directly proportional to the aggregate freedom of a population. It's a mathematical equation because the laws of creation aren't personal forces. Uh, it's another thing that people have a very difficult time with, with the world of the occult, what it teaches, what natural law is and how it operates. Uh, we've been very conditioned to see things in religious contexts, meaning personal higher forces, personal gods, personal laws that are implemented by those personal gods. And that is not really how the, uh, the justice-conserving machine 
of consciousness that is the universe really operates it's it operates through impersonal forces does it have a preferred outcome yes it does so that it also implies a consciousness i'm not saying that the universe has no consciousness like a machine i'm saying its laws operate like a machine because for perfect justice to exist there can't be partiality it has a preferred outcome meaning it wants people to go along with the laws of creation of morality and behave morally and get good consequences good uh, created results that's the real law of attraction how we behave is what creates the results that we experience and the universe has a preferred outcome it wants goodness it wants optimum outcome it wants evolution it wants further consciousness higher level consciousness more differentiation of forms and of thought and growing that continually and complexifying it continually and making uh, much more beauty in the world and goodness in in, in the universe in general um, however it doesn't it has to be impartial and therefore it is going to allow anything. It's not going to step in and intervene because then nothing is learned. Then it, it's supporting us and it's not allowing us to grow individually through our own expression of consciousness and our own learning and growth. It, our learning and growth, the universe wants it to be self-directed and indeed it demands it to be self-directed. That's why no external power will step in to save us from ourselves. The, the savior myth and savior complex comes from traditional forms of religion, which are all there to stop us from actually learning and growing and doing autodidactic meaning self-directed learning about how the forces of the natural world work and how the laws of the universe work and integrating that into our own being coming into alignment with those laws and forces and then growing that's what true evolution in consciousness is i'm not talking about what is traditionally looked at as darwinian evolution uh, that I don't necessarily subscribe to in the form that it is it is put out to us But I'm talking about true evolution in consciousness in knowledge in understanding in morality, etc uh, That is what our real goal here is to do as beings that this is the purpose of being here on this planet and having a body and living human life It's one of the grand purposes of it uh, a lot of people have not discovered that a lot of people are floating through life without a purpose you know a lot of people don't accept the existence of natural law they don't accept the existence of morality they're moral relativists you know that's another thing that comes out of the teachings of occultism that moral relativism can only lead to a state of total confusion when it comes to uh, understanding what is right and wrong and therefore you don't get the results that you say you want on the other side of the equation because if 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 it's all relative and there's no such thing as truth and there's no such thing as morality and morality we can get to make up that's what man's law is moral relativism it's like you can do this behavior here but you can't do it here so you know you can open carry a firearm without a license in one state if you open carry a firearm in another state in the United States, you can go to jail for 10 years, right? So who's correct? The law is obviously relative because in one place, it's one thing and in another place, it's another thing. Well, does that logically make sense philosophically and morally? Of course it doesn't. That's a huge crock of BS, okay? What it, what it really is, is one state has it correct because they are honoring the actual natural law I'm not saying that that makes them correct for existing as government, right? But they're they're factually correct that people do have the right to put a firearm on their body and carry it openly or concealed, whatever they choose, right? You have a right to protect yourself. You have a right to defend yourself. You don't have a right to commit violence, but you have a right to defend yourself with weaponry if you choose. The state that says we'll throw you in 10 years if we find you carrying a firearm open or concealed without our uh, permit our permission, which is what permits are, commands of compliance that we'll do violence to if you don't comply with, um, they're incorrect morally. And, you know, some states can do different variations of it and say, well, you, you can do this, you know, in these cities, but not in these cities. And it, it's all gradations of being wrong, right? Um, the goal is to actually be factually correct about rights. See, that's why they're called rights. See, right correctness and right morality are 
one and the same, essentially. When you are incorrect factually, that leads you to incorrect or immoral behavior. That's why we use the same word, right, to mean both factually correct and in alignment with moral principles. They are, they are both right. And we use the word wrong, meaning both factually incorrect and immoral, out of alignment with moral principles. So it's, it's very interesting how the English language uh, evolved to reflect that in those words. And it reflects the actual truth of the matter. That is why we have to be correct about what our rights are and are not. That's why we have to be correct about does authority actually exist in nature or is it only a claim of certain people who want power over other people and want to do <coughs> excuse me <coughs> want to do violence to them whether directly or indirectly through order followers again the the real ruling class of our world does not do the violence directly this is another big principle and it's another thing that occultism will help you to understand. They want to be insulated as much as possible from the very intense moral culpability that the universe, that the, the natural law is going to hold them according to. It's going to hold them to, to that standard. So they want to isolate their behavior from it as much as possible. And so what they do is they only issue the commands verbally or on paper. They very rarely, if ever, bloody their own hands. You will notice that. And it's not so much that they are just cowards. Yes, the, the, the real rulers of our world, of our society, are cowards. I would call them cowards directly to their face because they are. They don't want to get their hands dirty. Most of them are weaklings that if literally you punched them, they would turn to dust. OK, that is how much of, of bodily weaklings they are. You'd break their bones, you'd shatter their bones to dust. OK, certainly if I hit them, they would. OK, and what I'm saying is they don't want to get involved in direct violence because they know that they would lose and they're cowards on in that respect, certainly. But what you learn if you really study how the occult world operates is it operates through mind control and mental manipulation. OK, tons and tons of different mental forms of manipulation, obfuscation, you know, uh, creating chaos to, to justify what you're going to do next. There's a million different methods that they use. Religion, certainly a big one. OK, poisoning the environment, poisoning food and water, etc. OK, to degrade people's ability to, to think things through. The media is a big one, constantly hammering people with untruth. And this is all parts of occultism. It's all parts of the dark occult because the dark occult world just wants people to be ignorant. It just wants them to not be able to perceive reality and truth accurately. OK, if we are perceiving it accurately, that means we have a higher consciousness. If we don't perceive it accurately, we have a lower consciousness. Consciousness is just the ability to perceive what is really taking place in the world around you and within you, inside your own personality, inside your own psyche. OK, if we're very adept at that, people aren't going to slip things by us. We're going to see them for what they are. If we don't become adept at that through studying ourselves, through studying consciousness, through studying the laws of the occult, we're going to be able to be manipulated like taking candy from a baby per proverbially okay and so that's the goal of studying the, the the world of the occult the teachings of the occult the laws of the occult they are hidden from people for a reason they don't want people to learn and grow about how reality actually operates so they're holding that information as tightly to their chest as possible while using the knowledge of how the psyche really works and how the laws of nature works against people they're holding that back dissuading people from looking into it so oh, no don't look at that that's all evil that's all bad religion tells you that, that you don't, don't look at that you don't need to be concerned with that but then they know it all so that's like saying don't ever look at mathematics don't ever look at arithmetic you don't want to learn how to add or subtract keep away from that division and multiplication i mean that's bad stuff right so then when you go to their store they're like you're like how much is uh you know this uh you know pack of gum and they're like, well, that's going to cost you about $25,000. So, you know, uh, you, they, they'll, they'll fork over whatever you tell them because they don't even know arithmetic or they don't know what something's worth. Or, you know, you, you say that's $5. They give them $5. You give them a, you give them a penny back for change. And, and, and they're like, is this right? And you're like, absolutely, that's right, because they don't know how to add, subtract, multiply, or divide.
you know? So that's what the occult world is doing. It's that simple. It's keeping people from the basic building blocks of understanding, of learning, of knowledge uh, about how our world is actually put together, how it works, how we work, most of all, how the individual and the psyche works and operates, how it could be manipulated and uh, changed for the better or the worse through information. And, um, you know, uh, that is why um, if people do not learn occult information, they are not going to come to the heart of the matter, which is natural law, which is all about conscience and the knowledge of the difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. And if we don't understand the covert slavery is wrong behavior because we haven't studied the body of occultism that deals with morality. OK, the actual body of hidden knowledge that says there are natural laws that deal with consequences of behavior that we put out into the world individually and in the aggregate. We're not going to understand the difference between right and wrong. And that's what they want. The, the dark occultists who are running our society want total confusion in people's minds of the difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. That actual difference is objective and is not subjective. It is not up to us to decide. We look at the behavior. We say, does this behavior initiate harm or violence against another sentient being? If it does, don't conduct that behavior. It's a moral wrong. If it doesn't, then we reserve it as a right. And nobody has the right to say we can't do it by claiming authority over us and then ruling our behavior as our rulers, our masters. And that is what the position philosophically of true anarchy is. It's saying only do that which is right. Don't conduct that which is wrong. No one else has the right to act as your master over your behavior. They have a right to defend themselves if what you're doing is wrong and they have a right to defend others, but no one has the right to rule over you as your claimed owner or master. And this is borne out in the definition and the uh, etymology of the word. Anarchy comes from Greek. The prefix an means without or absent, not present. And the noun archos, archon in Greek means ruler or master in the connotation of a ruler over subjects such as a king or a master over slaves, a slave master. OK, the word archon meant that an authority figure that is claiming rulership and mastery over another. And then you put that together with the absence of an an archos an archon anarchy. Right. It means the absence of a ruler, no ruler, no master, the absence of rulership in a society. Well, what is rulership? Ancient rulership or kingship was the claim of authority over other people as one's subjects. The king or queen was the sovereign, the one that there is no ruler over. Sovereign means not a slave. S super regnum in Latin, above rulership. So the sovereign is the one that's above rulership. Rulership is all, for all the people down here. The sovereign's above that. That's the master. OK, that's the king or queen. Everybody under her is him, him or her is their subjects or slaves. It's an interchangeable word. Kingship is interchangeable with authority. Subject is interchangeable with slave. It's the same conceptual idea. So all that happened in the modern world is rulership was be being challenged, right? Kingship and queenship was challenged by the people and saying, what gives you the right to be the king or queen over us, to be the ruler over us and rule all of us as your subjects or slaves? And the answer always came back, our genetics, our bloodline. And God gave us the right, quote unquote, God, right? God doesn't give anybody the right to rule over others. God created an anarchic system where no one has the right to rule over others because we are all the sovereigns. We are all imbued with no authority over us, okay? The only authority that truly exists over all of humanity and all of the universe is natural law. And so you see the dark occultists want to usurp the place of law and they want to be the lawgivers when there is only one lawgiver and that is the force, the consciousness, the 
um, collective universal being that is all that created the universe of matter and the universe of law L law and what it governs meaning all matter and all beings in it now you can call that god I'm perfectly comfortable with that. You can call that a higher force. You can call that a higher power. You can call that universal law, universal consciousness. I don't really care what name you give it. It's something that human beings in our form will not be able to directly perceive and understand, but we can understand how the consequences of the laws that it put into effect work and therefore recognize the existence and operation of those laws and therefore recognize the existence of some power that put those laws into effect at the time of the creation of the universe or just steady state universe if you believe that it's always been that way because that is how the universe was generally constructed it was made that way it, it operates according to laws it's not chaotic okay it's not random planets don't go in random orbits they have laws that govern orbits solar systems have laws that govern them planets have laws that govern them weather systems have laws that govern them matter all the way down to the subatomic level has laws that govern them human behavior has laws that govern it it's, it's it's not exempt from law just because people don't want some force being higher than themselves so there is a higher power but it's not the power in the same sense of authority as making a claim over another being see that's a personal force at work that's somebody's will directly saying yes i'm going to do this to you because i want to have power and i want to have rulership and ownership over other beings this force that governs all of creation is impersonal it's an impersonal force and it just sets the law into effect because that is what maximizes the possibility for per, per, um preferred outcome right it wants more complexity it's a complexity conserving engine it's a justice conserving engine so we're always really getting justice we're always really getting what we deserve even if we can't perceive that the universe isn't broken universal laws are not broken people are broken humanity is broken and needs to be fixed and yes it does is broken and does need to be fixed people want to say oh nothing's broken people aren't broken they don't need to be fixed yes they do their thought processes is broken are broken their understanding is broken their morality is broken their will is broken their perception is broken largely most people not all people some have healed themselves that's the goal that's what we need to do okay um but there is a preferred outcome that these impersonal laws are working toward and if we buck them and try to go against them and that's what the dark occultists have done they've said we don't care about these laws we want to be the lawgiver we want to be god we want to be the one who says how it works and then that becomes reality here in our little pocket our little isolated prison that we've made called the earth okay that's psychopathic that is totally chaotic and can only lead to more forms of chaos and destruction and death that's why the reins of power must be taken away from these people's hands and not given to anybody you know there should be no reins of power there should be no throne to sit upon we have to destroy the concept of authority as being morally legitimate it is not morally legitimate anywhere in the universe we are pariah of the universe as beings. Other beings aren't going to swoop in here and rescue us from the mess we've made for ourselves here on Earth. People expecting that to happen are delusional. They're looking at us and going, good God, keep that virus isolated over there so it doesn't infect anywhere else in the universe. They look at us with pity and contempt, not admiration and like, woe is them. Oh, let's go help the poor little humans, you know? And anybody expecting that, you know, it, you're, they're stuck in religious virus forms of thought. The New Age movement is a very dangerous thing that comes out of dark occultism that is teaching people, oh, just observe or wait for the 
aliens that are, you know, or uh, spiritual beings that are going to descend out of the fifth dimension and save us. You know, no, no, no scenario like that's coming. It's up to us to learn how natural law operates, and it's up to us to save ourselves. And do we need saving? Yes, we do, but not in the religious sense of needing saving. We need saving from tyranny and slavery. That's what we have to save ourselves from. Nobody's going to save us from the tyranny and slavery that human beings made and human beings allow to persist. No one's coming in here and going, gee, what a brilliant idea, guys. You made these systems. You made these institutions. They ultimately enslaved you all. You created that for yourself. And while you're in it, you still condone it because you, you're up such a low level of consciousness in, in vibration and in understanding that you can't even see the slavery that you're in. What being's going to come down and say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I want to take responsibility for that level of unconsciousness. Then they're holding the bag, right? Yeah, that, that's what we want to do, right? Don't don't we want to go and just rescue every form of lower life that's extant in the universe and take responsibility for it and just save it all? No, we're we're looking for our development, just like other beings want to be left alone and pursue their own development. You know, that's why personally I look at an extension of anarchy and natural laws, leave the animals alone. The animals want to be left alone to their own devices and live their own lives. They're not that those their lives aren't my own. I leave them alone. The first principle of natural law is leave other life alone. Live your life. You learn and grow. Now, that doesn't mean don't influence people. That's the great work. I mean, don't try to control it by leave it alone. Don't get involved in trying to tell it what it can do and control it, right? This is the, this is the human fall out of higher consciousness, okay, and it being stuck in base level consciousness. Most people just don't know how to leave other people alone, and most people don't advocate to leave other people alone. All you, it's very easy. All you got to do is say no violent or coercive behavior should be done to those people so long as they're not doing violent and co coercive behavior to others. And this here is the problem. Everybody is afraid that someone will do violent and coercive behavior. So we pre-put coercion into effect to prevent people from doing violent and coercive behavior instead of just dealing with violent and coercive behavior. And if we were doing that, we wouldn't have the kind of crime we have. We wouldn't have government because that in its, of itself is violent and coercive behavior, right? Which any moral being will say we shouldn't have. I'm against all forms of violence and coercion. I won't even kill a bug. I will pick, capture a bug and take it outside my home. I will not interfere with that life because it's on its own trajectory. It's on its own path in consciousness. That's not mine. I don't own that. I don't want to control that. I don't want to destroy that. I don't have the right to. Right. It's very easy to leave things alone. It's very easy to leave other people alone, but people can't seem to learn that. And that's really the first principle. you got to sit down with yourself and ask yourself, you know, shadow work is a big part of the occult. People don't have internal dialogues and discussions with themselves in silence. you got to ask yourself, what do I want control over this for? Control is always comes out of fear. If you want to control other people, it's fear. That's leading you to control. That's why people want laws. That's why people want government. They want to feel safe. They want to feel like they're cared for. They want to feel like they're going to be in some cocoon or, or, or in some nest or something be, uh, safe. And there's no such thing. There is no such thing as safe, as permanent, enduring safety in the 3D physical world. We, we are physical creatures living in a physical domain. There are dangers associated with that naturally. We have to accept that. We have to purge that fear from our consciousness because one of the things that is taught in the occult, and I reiterate all the time in my work, is slavery comes from a particular kind of fear. It comes from primal fears, okay? And the biggest primal fear of all is the fear of death, the fear of what people perceive might be the cessation of consciousness, which I do not feel or believe that it is. I feel that consciousness continues in a multifaceted variety of forms, in a multifaceted variety of places and, and times, and continues on and on and on. People have that existential fear of death as the end of consciousness. And that's the true beginning of all forms of slavery. All forms of control are built upon the illusion of wanting to be safe, all forms of control and slavery, slavery are ultimately built upon the ultimate primal fear, the fear of death. So an occult principle that is taught is 
The very beginning of the enslavement process is the fear of death. If you continuously fear death and you live in existential doubt of survival of consciousness beyond the physical, then you are going to be more apt to let control come into your heart. You're going to be more apt to condone control of both yourself and others. And I word it in the phrase, the fear of death is the beginning of slavery, very simply. You know, uh, that's something that individuals have to work upon. You are not going to be physically safe forever in the 3D. Eventually you will age. Eventually you will grow sick. Eventually you will die. We all will. No one lives forever. Nothing lives forever. It's a continuous cycle of consciousness. And people have to become okay with that. Uh, not just intellectually okay. They need to become okay with it in the core of their being. And that's what occult practices help with. M true meditative practices. True practices of introspection and shadow work. You know, they have deep internal value. And they can purge these kind of primal fears. Largely. Not saying you ever really get rid of it f fully. You know, there's always something in the back of your mind. Hey, I'm going to die one day, right? It doesn't mean you let that direct your life. You know, you don't live your life in fear. You know, you, you live your life to try to better yourself and try to help others around you to better themselves. And that's what the occult also teaches. It does. It teaches you can't control people, but you do have influence in this world through your words, through your actions. Most of all, we can influence others to not be as afraid to 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 help them to grow courage internally and grow the courage to act in the world at large, externally, so to speak. Okay. So we have the ability and the power to influence others if we step into that role, right? If we grow courage within ourselves and then we step into that role of right action through influence, through words and behaviors. There's nothing wrong with that type of influence. When the influence is based upon something that is untrue, you know it's untrue and you try to propagate the untruth, that's called deception. That is not a right. That is one of the transgressions against natural law. And that is what the um, you know, controllers of our world, the social engineers, are always doing. They're always deceiving people so that they come out on top. And again, to go back to the karmic idea of them trying to shield themselves from the consequence karmically that comes down upon them, they don't really bloody their hands. They get their order followers to bloody their hands. They tell other people, you should be doing this to people. It will enlist you. We'll pay you these worthless slips of paper uh, called money, you know, that is all also invented and made up. And you do the dirty work that bloodies your hands and actually gives you the real karmic uh, consequence, the real, um, you know, uh, moral culpability. Because you perform the behavior with your own body. How many lawmakers perform the violence that their laws command with their own bodies? You think members of Congress go out into the world and when they say, oh, you didn't get a permit for that l child's lemonade stand. Do you think they go out there with a sledgehammer and bust down the lemonade stand? And if the, the parent and, and or the child resists, a beat, beat them and drag them into a cage? No. The, the lawmakers never, ever dirty their hands like that. They just write down a bunch of nonsense on paper and then call it law, put it in a legal book. Then the order followers, the police, go and actually do the karmic behavior, the actual physical world, real 3D behavior with their body violently to another being or group of beings, and therefore they're taking on the karmic debt. And the, the, the lawmakers and the social engineers are laughing at these people hilariously. They're just laughing at them like big, on, full belly laughs. Board. <laughs> yeah. Worse than that, they, they literally, in the world of the dark occult, call them their animals. They call them their dogs, their pets, their animals on a leash. Literally refer to them like that in the People open. referred to slaves like that, too, back then. They, they couldn't it. read or write either. So they couldn't Aren't permitted to. anything. That's right. Weren't permitted to learn those learning tools. Forget it. You know, that would have been forbidden. You know, I, I showed um, uh, someone recently an interview 
that I showed as part of my, uh, again, this directly relates to Aaron's original question about why should people learn about the occult and how is that directed to, to human freedom and uh, directly related with understanding the immorality of slavery. Um, you know, these people are very open about their rulership of our society. They're, they're, it's not as covert because there's, I was explaining to this person who I showed this video to, which I'll tell you about in a moment, j just as a little side anecdote here. Um, there's a little war. There's a little war of contention. I wouldn't say it's going to like erupt into a big hot war in the dark occult community, but there is a very distinct uh, differentiation of opinion regarding the direction that uh, their form of rulership should continue to go. And uh, it breaks down like this. There's a uh, a large group that wants covert slavery to continue. I'd say it's probably about 70 to 75% of the dark occultists of the world are okay with the continuation of covert slavery through mind control, mental manipulation, false media, you know, putting out deception and disinformation. They're okay with it progressing like that. 25 to 30%, I would say, are this new breed of dark occultists that take the approach that we want to externalize our power. We want to come out into the open and we want to tell people we are your owners. We are your rulers. We are your masters. You are our slaves. You are our subjects. If you do not obey what we tell you, you must or must not do. We will send our henchmen to kill you. They want the world to be structured in a totalitarian prison society like that. They don't want to do it through manipulation and even pharmaceutical means, et cetera, drugs technology. Okay? and technology. They don't want to do it like that. They mm -hmm. want the hard hand. They want to take the velvet glove off and present the iron fist. And they want to pound on humanity with the iron fist into total submission or even extinction if necessary. That's how psychopathic this about one quarter of the dark occult have become. And, uh, uh, a Hollywood television show was made about this. It was called True Blood, um, where it's about vampires. And one vampire group sa uh, sang uh, section or a faction, I should say, um, wants to continue to to feed off of human beings in the shadows. And this is just allegorical for the war that's going on in the occult world. Then there's another group that says, no, we should come out in the open and we should present ourselves and we should tell human beings, you are our food and we are going to feed upon you openly. What are you going to do about it? Okay. And they still want to make it like a cooperative thing where they get people at first to volunteer, but they really don't intend to stay that way. They intend to just, you know, actually go after people as a food source eventually. And there's this discontention uh, among the two factions. And that's what the whole TV show is ultimately eventually about. This is happening in the real occult world. Uh, this is the dynamic known as the externalization of the hierarchy. And what the hierarchy is, is the hierarchy of slavery. It's the hierarchy of rulership over other people through them being the masters. Then they have their order following class, the police and military, or actually above that, they have the lawmaking class, the politicians, then the police and military. Then you have, you know, the corporations and the people, et cetera. And that is, you know, how it has worked through covert hierarchy. They want to bring that hierarchy of power out into the open publicly and just tell people this is neo-feudalism. This is just a new form of feudalism. We're the authority. We're the king. You're our serfs. You're our subjects. You own nothing. You'll do what we say or there will be violent consequences enacted upon you by our order followers. And that's what it really is now, except most people don't know it because it hasn't been publicly announced that it is that way. But guess what? It actually has. Because th there are actual real world occultists that are coming out in the open and saying, this is what we're going to do. This is what we want to do. We're already in power and we're going to do it. And the interview that I presented in my presentation on dark occultism called uh, Demystifying the Occult Part 2, Satanism and the Dark Occult. I played an interview from the year 1988 or 89 with a Satanist who was married to the then high priest of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey's daughter, Zena LaVey. His name is Nicholas Schreck. He was on a 
uh, racist, um, like sort of a white power type, um, you know, neo-Nazi type, neo-fascist type uh, cable access TV show with a, a guest named Tom Metzger. And Metzger, uh, the host, I mean, Metzger was interviewing Shrek and he was asking him, well, you're a Satanist and, you know, you're, you, you believe in all of these tenets of Satanism. He said, what would the world look like if you were in power? And Shrek looked at him like, oh, you don't really understand, do you? He said, we are in power. We already are in power in the world. He said, we are waging a guerrilla war against the human mind through every form of media that we already control. And he said, our goal isn't to be in power. It's to tighten our reins of power such that it makes what Hitler was doing in the 1930s and 40s look like a picnic. He literally says that in the interview out in the open. And you can bet he got in some trouble with those above him in the hierarchy of Satanism, because at that point, they certainly didn't want loose cannons like that going out there and saying that out in the open to the average cattle. OK, they want people to believe in the legitimacy of their own rulership called being a subject of government. OK, they do not want people perceiving it as it actually is a system of slavery based on violence and duress by which the masters are telling you you must comply or violence and death will be conducted upon you. That's the actual point of fact reality of the situation. But at that point, they certainly did not want people perceiving it that way. They wanted to continue their overt form of mental manipulation. Now, what Shrek did is now becoming more popular with people like Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates and others, they're still somewhat covert, but they are pushing more toward this full overt depopulation agenda, making sure people comply or they know violence will come or they know they will be ostracized from society by how it's structured. Uh, there was an interview recently done by the eugenics think tank operation known as the Club of Rome. It's a dark occult organization, although more on the front lines as an interface between people and the occult world. I was continually re referred for the Club of Rome when I was in Satanism, when I was a Satanist and involved with satanic grottos in my era, right. higher level occultists in that, uh, you know, those grottos always said to me, if you go further, if you really take this mantle up and go and pursue it truly, you're going to be perfect for the club of Rome. I heard it from at least six or seven people. Okay. And they knew what my intellect and my communication skills were like. And they also knew what my mindset back then was like as far as how psychopathic I was and how much I wanted depopulation and eugenics. It was one of the big things I talked about as a Satanist. That was my little uh, you know, speciality within the world of the dark occult. And that's why whenever I talked about it, they heard my passion for it back then in my screwed up mind state, mindset. And they said, if you go further in this, I, we can almost guarantee you you're going to work with the Club of Rome. And recently, this year, a representative of the Club of Rome, who I'm, I, I'm not positive, but I believe he's like on their steering committee, slash, steering committee slash board of directors possibly, but I'm not sure about that. Don't hold me to that. But he's certainly a spokesperson for them, at least. He said there is an ongoing worldwide depopulation agenda taking place and active right now. And it is my hope that that agenda proceeds in a civil fashion and doesn't erupt into violence and war, meaning against them. You know, wow. he said that out in the open in an interview, in a video interview. And all you have to do is type Club of Rome depopulation civil the word civil, C-I-V-I-L, because he states in it, he wants it to proceed in a civil fashion. Then you'll get his name and you can watch the whole interview. This is the mindset of the dark occult. 
clearly they believe that they are owners over other people. Clearly, they believe they have the right to direct not only their characteristics eugenically, but they have the right to end the characteristics and even the people that they see as undesirable or unfit to continue in their world. There is no better definition of slavery. That is exactly what slavery is. You claim ownership over other beings. You claim what other beings may express. You claim what they may own. And you even claim whether they can reproduce, what characteristics they may reproduce, and whether they may even continue to live and propagate their bloodline. Their God. Imagine God. that. Their God in that sense. Yeah. It's, but it's false. It's unnatural. Of course. It's immoral. I mean, this is why we have this phrase, I guess, liberty or death, right? I mean, like you said, if we fear death, this is the number one thing toward our enslavement. Well, what's the opposite of slavery? It's freedom. That's right. Freedom it's is life. Slavery is death. Slavery is worse than death. There are things that are worse than death, and slavery and tyranny is one of them, because that yeah, means yeah. the greatest gift of all creation that has been endowed upon us, that we are endowed with as natural beings in this universe, is free will. To self-direct our development, our evolutionary progress in consciousness on this planet and who knows where other realms we may go to if we do truly evolve out of this lower dense uh, vibratory level of consciousness and into a higher one that that has deep understanding of of natural law and universal law and and how karma really works and what morality really is that's my hope i want to see where humanity can truly go i see a lot of potential in our species as bad as it is and i constantly reiterate and remind people how bad people have become that is not eternal that is not set in stone that's a choice that's a choice through remaining ignorant. Would you we have say, a choice. Would you, yes. Would you say they, they'll learn one way or another? Absolutely. Because the universe is going to give us this lesson the hard way or let us self-direct uh, our progress in consciousness, uh, which we are in charge of as of right now. But at some point, when we become so imbalancing to other natural systems around us, and I'm not necessarily even saying it's just the earth. That, that those natural systems certainly extend beyond the earth. When we get destructive to the local neighborhood, then higher forces do intervene and say, whoa, 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 whoa. That, you, that can go down in your local neck of the woods, but it ain't going down here, boys and girls. And then it says, well, we do have to shut this down a little bit, maybe not to the point of extinction, but maybe to the point of near extinction. Stagnation. Right, and, and say, we're going to set, it, set this uh, little petri dish back about 250,000 years, you know, and then let, let's see if you can get it right on the next round, you know, forward. We're de-evolving, essentially. Right, right. I mean, we look right at now, unfortunately. What they taught, right? That's all right. This occult knowledge goes back many years. Would you say a lot of this occult knowledge kind of stems back, or does is Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas and the deists uh, of the 18th century, would you say they're kind of related and connected to this idea of natural law because usually oh, sure. when you look it up and you kind of get a basic understanding yes. of it it goes back to teleology of course uh, without a doubt they, they they are the modern um you know uh people who are keeping those ideas flowing and going in in the relatively modern world uh, i like to look at people like ourselves as the new modern age digital philosophers who are helping this to continue beyond our time mm -hmm. and uh, really evolve it as well and bring people into a deeper understanding of it because there's so much media that we can create and give to people for study regarding this. Um, I would say that those philosophers you mentioned uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, or even a couple hundred, are the, the ones who uh, picked up the mantle from the more ancient occultists that went back into, obviously, Egyptian times and then even antediluvian times or uh, pre-diluvian times. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, it was very much more evolved then. And uh, clearly there was a cataclysm that probably occurred around 10,500 BC or, or maybe a little bit uh, uh, longer ago than that. And um, it devastated a lot of this planet and set us back in our development. And then we've been rebuilding kind of ever since. And uh, these ideas have been uh, re-evolving ever since. But unfortunately, uh, authority and government have a deep head start on us uh, in their rebuilding project. And they have really done a number on the people of our world, unfortunately. We're playing catch up. 
but it is not something that can't be changed. This is not the default uh, human nature. I, I hear a lot of people use human nature in the wrong sense. Uh, the only nature that we have is that we are programmable through information. And a lot of people would be horrified by that statement and be like, oh, how could you uh, simplify and re reduce um, human nature to that? Because it's true. Do we come into the world evil beings ready to slay everybody in front of us? Or do we come into the world angelic beings, uh, you know, in higher consciousness, re ready to enlighten everybody? No, we need information before we behave anyway. And that's the formative years, the formats being laid in the body, computer, and the mind of information. That's the file system being laid. Then we install software, you know, and programs, and then we perform tasks and we process. And what comes out through behavior is what we get in the world. You know, it's very simple. We're not a computer, but we behave somewhat like the computer and our nature is like a computer. A computer's nature is to take in information and then compute and transform information and output information. Our nature is we take in information, we develop either an accurate understanding of reality and behavior, and then we use our logical processes to do that. And then that informs our physical behavior in the world. And then in the aggregate, we get the outcome, which is either orderly or chaotic. It's either good or bad. Right. Very simple. Good code in produ produces good output on the screen or on the disk or on the internet. Good information about morality into a human being creates good behavior and good output in the world. And then we get the good consequence, which is living in order and peace and justice together. And that's what we say we want, right? We say we want that, but then our behavior doesn't always align to it. Right, because there are requirements and knowledge for that that a lot of people don't want to fulfill the requirements by truly learning how to think and learning what morality is. And that's what we're here to help influence them to do. That's mm -hmm. our job. That's education. that's what I call the one great work is, a, is an effort of edification and true education. Which is not imposing our will and saying, oh, this is how we think everything should be done by gunpoint. You know, right. we're not forcing anybody to learn this knowledge. If anything, we're helping people realize that, wait, you shouldn't have other people decide what your life is to be uh, or what your rights are. Um, and, you know, you say that rights are a form of property. Well, if they're claiming ownership over your rights, they're claiming ownership over you. Equally and so, exactly. you know, I talk about objective morality. I just replace the word objective with natural and morality right. with authority. I call it natural authority. I say that's the way people should look at it because sometimes people get a little confused about the whole objective morality thing. But I say, well, look at moral relativism. See what it's done to our population over all these years. Of people just thinking, oh, I don't know what it is, or oh, it's tolerance, or it's this, but they can't get definitive as to what is right or wrong. You right. know, the school system is built around, oh, is this tolerable? Oh, is this inappropriate? But they never get clear on what is right and wrong. The trivium is not taught in schools either. And people right. really have no clue. Their nature is confused. So it is based in truth. You know, I can't breathe for you. You can't breathe for me. So it's incorrect if I claim to, to breathe for you. Um, and so it would equally be immoral, you know, so... One of the big questions, status, people who believe in authority and advocate for authority and government always give to people who say, I don't want a state. I don't want a government. I want to live in voluntary cooperation and peace together. And I want to speak out against violence, duress and coercion and not have that be the operating principles that our society is operating according to. They say, well, how would this work? And they have this institution or this uh, technology or whatever, you know, how would that work uh, in a voluntary society without duress and coercion and violence, you know, and they don't really hear themselves. They're like saying, listen, if you have to be ruled as a slave and have violence done to you to have a road, would you not want to live without the road? If I have to have, if I can't ever again have a, a, a cup of coffee, right? And you would say the 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 trade in for that is you're actually free and you're not enslaved. I would go, well, no, look, I need to be enslaved to have a cup of coffee. OK, they don't even they need to record yeah. themselves. I say record your voice and then play it back to yourself and hear how literally brain dead it sounds when you listen to what you're really saying. And what I answer is. I don't definitively know how, quote, that would work in a truly free voluntary society, because guess what? 
there would probably be hundreds of thousands of methods invented as to how that would work. And then people could organize to say, I'm going to choose this. I'm going to choose that. I'm going to do nothing and not have that. That would also be a freedom of choice option. Mm -hmm. I want people to be free to choose how they would have something work, not to have one method imposed upon them through violence and authority. And it doesn't mean a lot of people think, oh, a free society, society would mean technology would have to go away because look at how bad this evil technology is being used. Wrong. Cities would not have to go away. People would probably not choose as much to live in tightly condensed cities. They would spread out because of technological solutions that would be invented and would do things much more efficiently even than cities. And you can go and live in the countryside and still have all the amenities of life and be spread out a little bit more and have more room. You know, it doesn't mean we don't have technology. It means we're going to invent technology that is employed in different, smarter ways. It's a tool. It's a double-edged sword. It can be used for bad. It can be used for great good. You know, there's, I say there's only two methods of human improvement, philosophy and technology. And philosophy has to come first. That's the primary. There is a hierarchy and pecking order to what things improve human conditions. Philosophy is the, is the very foundation. You have nothing without that. Then technology can help with physical 3D worldly things, tasks getting done, making life easier physically, right? And communication, you know, obviously it's much easier with technology to communicate these ideas to the amount of people that we're communicating them to in the ancient world would be next to impossible with, you know, scrolls and, and, uh, you know, Uh, ink forget it you'd be you'd be there you would not be able to do it you it wouldn't matter how many lifetimes you lived it wouldn't be possible to reach as many people as we can with modern communications so it's obviously able to be put to work for good instead of evil and control we have to make that choice see this is the whole thing now, the whole thing that it ultimately comes down to is there's great news there's not just good news there's great news. There's things to be actually not just feeling good about, to be excited about, right? Obviously, there's a lot of doom and gloom, and there's a lot of things to look at that are horrible, right? And I remind people of that. We can't lose sight of those things. We have to be objectively honest about how bad things are. But the great news is this is changeable because we have the ultimate opportunity we have the ultimate forms of communication at our disposable at our disposal if we only learn how to use them if we take a little bit of the time of our lives to invest educationally in learning how to use the great tools that we have at our fingertips and just start to use them wisely to teach morality and natural law and that our society is structured as a form of slavery and educate people to that educate people to how morally wrong how things currently are and that they can improve them if we stop believing in this system and giving it our power and complying with it and teaching other believing ourselves that it's morally legitimate and teaching other people that it's morally legitimate when it is not this is the grand opportunity that is before us Mm -hmm. you know that opportunity has never existed before as far as we know in human history we never had access to this type of technology and this reach the reach that we can have towards so many people in our world. And what are people largely doing with it? They're squandering the opportunity. They're squandering it because they want their little measly lives to live only for their selfish interests. And they won't look beyond themselves and say, I got to put some of my selfish interests aside at this point in human history because of how bad things are. And I got to learn how to reach out and teach people. I got to learn the technology to reach out and teach people. This is the advantage and the opportunity that we have at this point in human history, and we cannot let it go to waste. Yeah, and it's amazing how you look at statism and every argument pretty much fails from the ground up because it's immoral from the ground up. It doesn't matter whether it's this political party or that government, whatever form it is, if it all it rests on this one simple basis that it is immoral or unnatural, Everything that's going to come from it is going to be the, the same basis. And people believe that it's, it's real and that this government is a physical thing. It's like, how do we identify this thing? It's, it's amazing. But even in the anarchist crowd, right, we see there's people who don't talk about morality. 
They'll talk about the means of production all day long. They'll be talking about, you know, socialism, communism, all these different forms of economic policies. They're they're pointing externally, but they're never pointing the finger inwardly to the human heart and mind and and the thoughts that we condone. Right. I love I love that whole idea. It's it's a very it's very philosophically powerful to uh, word it and structure it as we are against all forms of slavery. We are abolitionists, voluntary voluntarists, yes, but moreover we are against and want to see the destruction of all forms of slavery. That's a powerful philosophical groundwork to to base things off of, and I want more people to see that and start talking about government as slavery, taxation as not just theft but as slavery, because Mm -hmm. the confiscation of someone else's labor, uh, which they performed with their body to get the fruits of those labors, is a claim of ownership against the body itself. Indirectly, yes, but it still is a claim of ownership of the body and therefore slavery. You know, even licensure. I'm not twisting the abolitionist words either. I mean, they said it themselves. (laughs) That's right. They made appeals. Look look at Frederick Douglass' words when he came up to the north, escaped slavery in the southern colonies, and came to the north. He basically was saying taxation is still taking uh, the the fruit of my labor from me, and what percentage of that constitutes not being slavery anymore. Those are basically Frederick Douglass's ideas. You know, I've reiterated them. It, you know, in the modern day, but that was Fred, Frederick Douglass asking the question, what percentage of my labor that you are allowed to confiscate legally makes it not slavery? You know, is it yeah. is it no longer slavery when it's only 10 percent? You know, is it no longer slavery when it's only 5 percent? Well, if you're commanding that I must give you the fruit of my labor because you're saying you're going to do beneficent things with it in society. And ultimately, that's ultimately a lie as well. We know that. Uh, but even if you were doing very benevolent things with it in society, what gives you the right to confiscate the fruit of someone else's labor non-voluntarily? That's coercion. That's duress because you're saying if you don't give it over, you're going to do violent things like confiscate it by force or even do harm to the person who refuses to turn it over. That's duress. That's coercion. And overall, that's slavery because the fruit of one's labor was made with their body. And if you're claiming to be able to confiscate the fruit of one's labor, labor, you're indirectly claiming ownership over the body. Very clear philosophically. That's what we got to do is get people down to those first principle arguments philosophically, right? People want to move beyond that to utilitarian things. I notice how powerful of an influence utilitarianism becomes in our society. Well, then how's this going to get done? I don't really care if it ever gets done. What those people are is a person living next to the, the plantation and saying, well, if those black people aren't enslaved, how is that cotton in the field going to get picked? You know, uh, you know, another friend of mine, Justin says, he jokes around. He goes, they were that averse to just some yard work, you know, just a little bit of uh, farm work that they wanted to do. Actually, they're taking the chance to go into war to continue to enslave these people. Right. Because they don't want to do some yard work, you know. Yeah. I mean, imagine not wanting to do your own physical labor. And so you're saying we're going to get other people to physically do that labor for us and get other people to then condone it. It's taxation is no different. Lack it's of just a it's a covert and slightly softer form of it that doesn't come with guns, whips, and shackles and chains, but it comes with these are the things we want to get done that we don't want to do directly. We're going to make other people pay for them by confiscating a, a certain percentage of their labor, whether they voluntarily voluntarily agree to give it or not. And we're going to do that through violent order followers called the police that are are going to come with guns and cages for people. They're going to put them in a mobile cage, handcuff them, put them in a mobile cage, and take them to a stationary cage, you know, with guns. So the people who condone that condone slavery. They condone coercion. They condone the removal of free will. They condone involuntary servitude. And they condone gun violence. And they're the kind of people that would be the first kind of person to tell you, I don't condone any of those things. They're religiously diseased. It's a re- government is not just a form of slavery. It is. It is slavery. It is a religion. It's a sick, psychotic, diseased, false religion that only serves to hold humanity back in progress, in consciousness and development.
here on this planet. That is ultimately what it is. And the people who believe in it are religiously demented. I want to say that definitively, and I'll say it in person to anyone that has a problem with me saying it. The belief in authority and government is a demented, sick, violent religion. And if you believe in those things, you are demented, mentally ill, sick, you condone violence, and you condone slavery of human beings. That's not my opinion. That's actually what it is by definition. Yeah, and I'm, I'd be willing to back it up as well. I mean, we're not baseless. We're not just saying these things. We have actual information that people should take the time and really reflect and think about what we're saying. You know, like you put out how many years of content of work have you put out? By Too now? many. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and same with myself already by now. I've done an unnatural law presentation, and one of my slides is the law of slavery, the law in quotes of slavery. And it claims that slavery is proportional to order. And that freedom is proportional to chaos, because that's what most people think about our world, is that freedom is chaos, and that it should be feared, essentially, and that slavery is order, and that in order to have order, you have to have external control, rather than internal Violence, control. Violence, right? Yes. It's exactly backwards. They have everything upside down and backwards. It, it's sad. It, it, it's, it's, um, it's not only angering and frustrating, it's very actually sad and depressing because you you realize because of the programmability of human nature and how badly someone can become screwed up in the programmable state you realize how far they can really take people into a demented form of thinking and absolutely not only incorrect not only immoral but a deranged form of thinking that they believe these things are justified and moral and necessary. And necessary is the worst thing because this is the idea of necessary evil. You know, Ma, uh, there, uh, uh, I believe it was Eckhart Tolle who said, um, evil is only perceived as necessary to a person until they realize that evil isn't necessary. So there is no such thing as necessary evil. You never need to comply with evil. We should never be tolerant to evil. We should always be completely intolerant to evil. Right. Evil is the destruction of freedom. Why would we call evil, evil is the destruction of human rights. Evil is violence. Evil is forced coercion. It is the removal of free will. It is the removal of consent. That's what authority implies by definition is that you have no right to say no. That is what consent is. Consent is saying I either want to voluntarily take part in this or no, no, I want no part of that. Stay away from me with that. Don't force that on me. If you have a right not to be raped, if you have a right not to have sexual relations with someone that you don't want sexual relations with, then you have a right not to be coerced against your free will consent when it comes to rules being set for you if you're not harming anybody else. Now, again, if you are harming anybody else, you forfeit your right to remain unharmed. If someone's actively doing violence to someone, they forfeit their right to remain unharmed by others. That's the self-defense principle. You always maintain the right to defend yourself against coercion, duress, and violence. We have to keep that in mind. There's a right to act against people who are violating natural law and violating the non-aggression principle. Yeah. But what I'm saying is people have been dementedly deceived into believing these people have a right to commit such violence. These people have a right to coerce people. They have a right to place people under duress and do physical violence to them if they refuse to comply. And they don't see that as the removal of consent. They don't see that as the removal of free will. They don't see that as a claim over your free will over your behavior, and thus over your body? How screwed up does someone's logic circuits have to become through deception and deceit and mind control and mental manipulation and social engineering to see those forms of violence and evil as not only justifiable, but as necessary? 
This is what I'm trying to say, how far gone mentally, psychologically, and spiritually most people in our society are. And that's why it's so important. If you do understand these moral principles, you have to teach them to others. And in, in order to get them out to a lot of people, you have to use modern communications through technology. That's what the internet is here for at this current time in our human history, not to play a bunch of stupid games or just, uh, you know, uh, indulge our, our pleasures through physical means or, or, or watching sports and stuff like that. It's here to teach our fellow brothers and sisters of the human family. That is what this is, the, the, the most immense opportunity for growth and development in the human species that has ever presented itself. And we cannot let that go by the wayside. We cannot squander that opportunity. Yeah. As the Liberator newspaper said back in the 1800s, our country is the world. Our countrymen are all mankind. And I think the coincidences are just too... <laughs> too coincidental uh the link between you know slavery and government and its history going back to the very first oldest form of government sumeria at least right. we can hold account to um and so thank you for joining us and sharing all about this and really getting into the action because that is the action right it's just it's mainly education it's it's just helping people wake up to who they are um by their nature. there's no no greater form of right action than moral education of our fellow human beings. That is what the great work ultimately is to do. And it's up to us to do it. No one's swooping down in here and saving us from this situation. We have to use our willpower. We have to use our intelligence. And most of all, we have to use our care for truth and for justice and for freedom to go and do that work in the world. And gentlemen, I thank you guys for doing that work and being a part of that liberation effort effort as abolitionists to end human slavery on this planet. That is what the great work is all about. So thank you for having me as part of this great summit. And uh, your questions were awesome and on point. Great interview. And uh, I hope people learn a lot from it. If you want to uh, visit more of my work, you can go to my website, whatonearthishappening.com. Corey and Aaron, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark.